My name is Nassim Sabs. Let me ask you a question. Has anything ever happened to you that you couldn't explain? That made you feel sort of foolish when you tried to tell somebody about it? Well, if it has, you have plenty of company, as you'll soon see. <laughs> Well, I don't rightly know. I'm stupid to the point to where I'm not really sure. Believe it or not, there are a lot of people on the outside that think about the possibility of you coming out of here, and they're genuinely scared of you. Oh, boy, I might just... just... Manson's first television interview since the murders begins badly. I mean, I no, know I told like... you I'm not going to sit in that damn chair, man. I'll stand okay. here and talk with the dude. Yeah. Manson refuses to sit Get in the chair provided. He says he's not going to look oh, up to anyone. But finally, Tom Snyder of the National crap. Broadcasting Company asks his first question. You know, you were sentenced to the gas chamber and then they modified the mm -hmm. death penalty. Were you happy when that was done? Was I happy when what was done? When you found out that you weren't going to the gas chamber. You're talking about dying. Now, it gets me nervous. Why? Did you have any thoughts about something? Was you wanting to go anywhere? Were you happy when you found out you weren't going to go to the gas chamber, Charles? Uh, I knew I wasn't going to go to the gas chamber because I hadn't done anything wrong. You scared to die? Sometimes I feel I'm scared to live. Living is what scares me. Dying is easy. Uh, how long have I been in jail? 34 years? 34 years, so, uh... Out of 47, you've been here 34. I've been in jail, uh, prison, uh, a long time, all my life. I was raised up in here. So I understand jail, so I understand myself, and I can deal with that. I set my cell, and I do my number, like a convict does his number. But there's different colors on different people's backs doing different things. There's a different world i love the world i live in too just like regan loves the world he lives in you love the world you live in <laughs> most assuredly it's me you love all the pain that you've caused people all oh. the anguish you've oh caused i don't people. know pain i don't know pain i have no depth of pain i have no depth of suffering i don't know ridicule i don't know all the bad things i haven't been punished by you all my life since i was 10 years old i've been in every reform school you got across the country and used to lay down and have to get my ass whipped till I couldn't walk. I'll try it one more yeah. time. Uh, no, uh, out. No, now, uh, the, you can see them where I'm You finishing. got a pistol on you? No, sir. They wouldn't let me in here if I had a pistol. Yeah. You know that as well as I do. So why even ask the question, okay? Well, I just thought you might not like what I've done. You want to do something about it? I don't much care for what you've done. Yeah. A lot of people don't. How do you feel yeah. about that? A lot well, of people think you're a monster, Charles. How do you yeah, they that? think you're a monster because you reflect this news media on me. Cult leader. I never had a long hair before I got busted. I never had a beard before I got busted. I went to shave, and the guy said, no, you can't shave. And I said, I need a razor to shave. He said, no, you can't shave. Said, Let me get a haircut. He said, no, we don't want you to change your appearance. They said I had a great family, and I was a following and leaders and all that. There was no followers and leaders. A bunch of kids out the ranch playing. To what, me. Playing at what? Playing at living. Do you miss women? Certainly. My goodness. Yeah, damn right. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think of women? Oh, I like them. Yeah, they're nice. If they're put together well and everything, and they're soft and spongy, yeah, they're nice. As long as they keep their mouth shut and do what they're supposed to do. Why do you say that? Because that's what a woman's supposed to do. Keep her mouth shut and do what she's supposed to do? Sure. And besides the son that you had in your marriage, you've got, what, four other children somewhere? Oh, I don't uh, uh, think I've been uh, 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 responsible for as much as you people want to lay on me. All right, somewhere out there, somewhere, there's at least one son that we know of that's your child, who's probably about 25 or 26 years old. You talk to that kid. What are you going to say to him? 
You gotta catch it on your own, boy. Train's hard. The road's rough. And that's it. It's all I knew. It's all anyone ever told me. All right. And you want to hear something? Yeah. He'll do it better than me. <laughs> do what? Whatever he does. <laughs> He'll do it a little better. Kids do, don't they? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes them such a guest. They always seem to get through. How were you in school? I hear that you weren't too good, but maybe I heard one. Uh, depends on which school. I did very well in reform school. Yeah. <laughs> I did good in, uh, in uh, every place that uh, I was ever told to do good in. I've been an outlaw ever since I was born. I went to reform school when I was about 10, and I learned to box and cry, and I learned to do all the things that you do in reform school. Then I went to, uh, I escaped there a bunch of times, and I went to prison, and I learned everything that you do in prison. And I talked to all the guys and asked them everything they knew, and they told me all the things they knew. And then I went to the end of it, and then the old man would be ready to die, and he'd say, well, son, uh, Sincerity is the best gimmick, remember that. And I said, all right, be sincere, That's, that'll win it. He said, that's it. Sincerity and honesty, he said, it'll do it. It'll trick them every time. <laughs> I said, well, sincere and honesty, I never tried that. <laughs> I tried everything else, but maybe I'll try sincere and honesty. So then I looked in the book and it says, the wages of sin is death. Now I figured, well, I don't want to die, so maybe I have been sinful here. Maybe I am wrong. Maybe I'll take a look at my life and say, well, I'm going to change it and start all over. You know, and I know I go to God and I say, hey, man, you're going to forgive me? And he's going to say, what do you do? You forgive you? I mean, what did you come to me for? Forgive yourself, man. Don't be bothering me. How do you feel about spending <coughs> the rest of your life in prison? Well, we're all our own prisons. We each are our own wardens and we do our own times. We used to get stuck in our own little trips and we kind of judge ourselves the way we do. You know, uh, I can't judge uh, nobody else. The best thing I could do is try to judge myself and live with that. Let's assume that one day you were paroled. Let's just parole. Well, let's just make believe. Do you ever think you will be? Yeah. Do I ever think I will be? Well, I've never been paroled before. I went up to the board, and they never would. They said I was incorrigible. <laughs> and uh, not only was I incorrigible, but that I'd never grow up. <laughs> and I kind of agreed with them. If you got out tomorrow, do you have any scores to settle on the outside? Scores? Uh, do I have any scores out there? And we're making believe, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, buddy. <laughs> well, I don't rightly know. I'm stupid to the point to where I'm not really sure. Believe it or not, there are a lot of people on the outside that think about the possibility of you coming out of here, and they're genuinely scared of you. Oh, boy, I might just, just make dust, everything, terrible. One little guy, terrible, ooh. Boy, how insecure are we as human beings? Put all our fear on one little guy, afraid to let him out. <laughs> he might break all the toys. <laughs> Why do you say little guy? <laughs> because I'm not the guy you trying to make out of me. That's not me. I don't know what my way is. Everybody keeps telling me I got all these things. So I read the other day where I had magical powers, and I told everybody in the chapel, I said, zap, 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 zap. I said, where's my magical powers? <laughs> well, you can't read, you can't believe what you read in the press. I can get no magical powers, mystical trips, and all that kind of crap. Yeah, it's kind of silly. Yeah, I'm getting witches and devils, and um, one guy come up and said, I, I heard you said you were Jesus. I said, uh, no, man, I ain't said nothing. He said, I'm glad. He said, I'm damn glad. I said, why? He said, I know you ain't him. I said, how do you know? He said, because I am. <laughs> OK, I was one of the Army's first space intelligence officers because they developed their space intelligence program at around 1990, and they were looking for uh, strategic intelligence officers to go into it. And I was looking for uh, some new adventures, and I said, okay, I'd like to uh, go into space. So 
I uh, went to the Army's uh, Space Institute and uh, became a 3Y uh, Guild officer, which is their space activities uh, designator. They didn't even, it was so new that the Institute didn't even have its own classes. They actually punted me to the Air Force, which had a joint space intelligence course that they ran in uh, Colorado Springs um, at Peterson Air Force Base. And uh, that's how I became qualified as a joint space intelligence officer. And after that, I was assigned to uh, J2X at uh, headquarters U.S. Space Command at uh, Peterson Air Force Base, which is the major headquarters that uh, has sub-headquarters for NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command with Canada, and, of course, the uh, command center there at uh, Cheyenne Mountain. So I worked there from 1990 to 1994 as uh, a J2X officer, and uh, that was just uh, prior to my retirement from active duty. I thought that was a kind of a good way to finish things off. <clears throat> Excellent. So your your so your question is okay? Are there UFOs? Correct. You know, for a start, okay. I got a simple answer. There sure are, and I can say this uh, for a very simple reason: that out there at Cheyenne Mountain, you know, our job was to look at absolutely everything up there in uh, in space. NORAD of course, came into existence to originally look for ICBMs that might be coming over the North Pole towards Canada and the United States from the Soviet Union, but its mission got bigger and bigger until it was required to actually look at everything up there. And if you think about it, there's an awful lot of crap up there in space. And some of it comes from Earth in the form of space junk from all the scores and scores and scores of launches and discarded pieces of metal, you know, over the years that's up there in orbit. Oh, yes. And is deteriorating all the time. And and there's also all kinds of crap that's passing Earth from other wares, you know, from out there in space. It's zipping by the planet, and some of it gets into the atmosphere, and the stuff that's in the atmosphere will either bounce off or burn up, uh, or if it's big enough, it'll land as a meteor somewhere. But uh, to make a long story short, there's an enormous amount of this. If you'll Google something like space junk on the Internet, you'll get a rough idea of what a huge amount of garbage there is out there. And we simply cannot track or identify it all. It was coming into our screens all the time. And if somebody pointed at a blip that was going through at a high rate of speed and said, okay, what's that? I haven't had the foggiest idea, General. Uh, you know, in another yes. 30 seconds, it'll be gone. So the mission of Space Command with regard to UFOs, you know, for you, for you UFO buffs, was really quite simple. We ignored that crap unless there was some reason to think that it posed a danger to the United States. So if you saw something that was big enough and, re and entering down here and looked like it was, you know, headed for a big city or Washington, then you would pay a lot of attention to it in a right, hurry. Right, right. But other than that, we just screw it, you know. I mean, there's all this stuff going on out there. It's like, watch, it's, it's like trying to watch the L.A. freeways. You know, good luck. Wow. And uh, and that's kind of the attitude that we have. So, yes, there was an enormous amount of UFO activity down there, up there, rather. And uh, some of it could be accidental. Some of it could be uh, deliberate. Some of it behaves very coherently. But even that is a kind of a hard judgment call to make because you think you're seeing something on a radar screen that looks as though it's intelligent activity and it may not necessarily be that at all. So, um while I was there, 1990 to 1994, we did not have any invasions. Is what I, I, I can tell you right. that. Understood. Yes. You know, we didn't have anybody that we had to scramble the jets and go up and try and shoot it down. But that's a good. As thing. far as UFO activity, sure, lots of it. So you don't you believe know, we're those reasons. you don't believe we are alone in the universe then? Well, I think that statistically, it would be crazy to say that, and to and to and you know, Carl Sagan would agree with me. <laughs> First by an Englishman named Alistair Crowley in the early 20th century. It entered its modern era in this country just about 25 years ago. Under the theatrical guidance of Anton LaVey, California-based high priest of present-day devil worship. LaVey founded the Church of Satan. Now, despite its preachings of evil and hate, the church and its offshoots are constitutionally protected religions. I believe that hate is necessary in a controlled way just as much as love is necessary. LaVey penned the best-selling Satanic Bible. It's the handbook of devil worshippers everywhere. And for a time, he was considered chic enough to attract the attention of Hollywood. After working together on a film, LaVey made Sammy Davis Jr. an honorary member.